You're listening to The Switch. The Switch is a podcast where we explore ideas and experiences that change our minds. Before I start this episode, I do want to just give a general introduction to The Switch as a whole. Now, this was a test episode that we recorded just to sort of clear up some things about our format and figure out some of the technical issues, but I think it's interesting nonetheless. Now, I'll be interviewing Alex Berner, who is typically my co-host, and we talk about boredom. I feel like I got a lot out of this conversation. Uh, I felt it was really interesting, but I think it highlights a couple of things that I just want to make explicit from the beginning about what we want to do with this podcast. So as I said, when I opened, we are here to explore ideas that change our minds or experience in some way things that put us on a new path or open up new ways of understanding things we didn't know about before. We also want to make sure we are exploring ideas that we agree with and ideas we may disagree with, because you never know, you might see us change our minds right here on the podcast. Finally, I do want to make a clear distinction from the start, and that is (laughs) I've got a personality that I like to debate and disagree with people sometimes, but I will always do my best to make a clear separation between people and ideas. And to illustrate that, there's actually a quote from Majid Nawaz. He says, no idea is above scrutiny, no person beneath dignity. And I really just want to make sure we embody that with this, with this show. And finally, we want this show to aim upwards. By that, I mean, this is about better ideas. This is about making sure that we're living life the best we can, making sure that we are paying attention when we're changing our minds and that we're changing our minds for good reasons. So with all that being said, if you like what we do here on the switch, you can check us out on social media on Instagram and Twitter. We are at switch underscore podcast. And on Facebook, we are the switch podcast. So without further delay, right into my interview with Alex Berner, We start with a quote from a book, Mindfulness in Plain English. Every musician plays scales. When you begin to study the piano, that's the first thing you learn, and you never stop playing scales. The finest concert pianists in the world still play scales. It's a basic skill that can't be allowed to get rusty. Every baseball player practices batting. It's the first thing you learn in Little League, and you never stop practicing. Every World Series game begins with batting practice. Basic skills must always remain sharp. Seated meditation is the arena in which meditators practice their own fundamental skills. The game the meditator is playing is the experience of his own life, and the instrument upon which he plays is his own sensory apparatus. Even the most seasoned meditator continues to practice seated meditation because it tunes and sharpens the basic mental skills he needs for his particular game. We must never forget, however, that seated meditation itself is not the game. It's the practice. The game in which those basic skills are to be applied is the rest of one's experiential existence. Meditation that is not applied to daily living is sterile and limited. The purpose of Vipassana meditation is nothing less than the the radical and permanent transformation of your entire sensory and cognitive experience. It is meant to revolutionize the whole of your life experience. Those periods of seated practice are times set aside for instilling new mental habits. You learn new ways to receive and understand sensation. You develop new methods of dealing with conscious thought and new modes of attending to the incessant rush of your own emotions. These new mental behaviors must be made to carry over into the rest of your life. Otherwise, meditation remains dry and fruitless, a theoretical segment of your existence that is unconnected to all the rest. Some effort to connect these two segments is essential. A certain amount of carryover will take place spontaneously, but that process will be slow and unreliable. You are very likely to be left with the feeling that you're getting nowhere and to drop the process as unrewarding. It is crucial for you to understand what meditation is. It is not some special posture. It is not just a set of mental exercises. Meditation is the cultivation of mindfulness and the application of that mindfulness once cultivated. You do not have to sit to meditate. You can meditate while washing the dishes. You can meditate in the shower or roller skating or typing letters. 
Meditation is awareness, and it must be applied to each and every activity of one's life. This isn't easy. And with that, Alex Berner, welcome to The Switch, which uh, eventually you will help me in welcoming guests too, but <laughs> for this uh, episode zero zero, you are our first guest. So thank All you. Right. Thank you. Uh, that was a passage from a book that you gave me called Mindfulness in Plain English. And um, the reason that I wanted to have you on as our first guest and the reason that I wanted to talk to you is you were the catalyst for me to begin my meditation practice. And specifically, there was a conversation that you and I had about how one of the benefits you had seen when you started meditating was that you were not feeling bored anymore or something along those lines is what you told right. me. And I remember that being the prime reason I decided to start meditating. So um, a little background information on how I know you. Um, you were actually the first person that I met at Berkeley College of Music before school even started. It was pre first semester ratings auditions, trying to, you know, place us into the correct classes, correct, correct level of theory and ear training classes. And, uh, I walked into the Berkeley bookstore and you were there too. Um, and we were both looking for books, I assume, and yeah. started talking to each other. And after that, you know, the rest is history. We were friends all four years. We were roommates for three of those four years. And now we started a company together, Mojo Filter Media. And uh, so, yeah, I, I want to talk to you about what that experience was like of sort of getting rid of uh, boredom or, or how your experience of boredom changed. So mm -hmm. first, if you could maybe sort of give some of your background uh, specifically in relation to how you felt boredom, like as a kid, some history, where did you come from? What was your experience with that? Okay, so... I grew up in rural upstate New York, and I was an only child. And as a kid, I played with Legos, video games a lot because I didn't always have somebody to play with. I didn't always have something to do. I didn't live in a, in a city or a town. Um, and on weekends, I would always hang out with my friends from school. And I remember just almost being scared of boredom where I knew my day was going to be so miserable if a friend couldn't go over or couldn't come over on the weekends. I remember on Friday frantically trying to like look through my phone uh like phone number sheet that we had on the fridge and just call up all my friends and who can come over tomorrow. Uh you know, and it always try to push their parents like can you, they come over earlier like 10 a.m., you know, 9 a.m. because I just knew every moment of the weekend where I didn't have something specifically that I was doing. I was going to be tormented by boredom. So as I got older, I was super bored throughout school, uh, especially in high school. And I, at that point, I was really into video games and role-playing games and stuff like that. And I remember just in, in some classes, just staring at the clock, um, like literally checking it every. 30 seconds to every minute, maybe, and just waiting to get home and play games. Um, eventually, I got to college where you described how, where we met Chase, and I probably didn't feel bored quite as much there just because it's such a, it's such a uh, busy environment where there were so many new things. Um, always had something to do, but I definitely had much more anxiety there too. And eventually I went through a period where I had some severe anxiety and it related to a, a number of things. And that's when I found uh, meditation, really just by luck. I was anxious sitting in my room, looked at the bookcase. It was like, I, I should read something that'll calm me down. And just, I picked up that book that I then gave to you the mindfulness in plain English. And I basically, I just, I was in a 
I suppose a vulnerable place or like a, a place where I was very receptive to new ideas or new information. So I, I really just took what the book said literally and just did what it said. And over the course of, honestly, it was probably like a week, maybe two weeks, uh, the meditation just totally changed where my mind was at. Yeah. So before we get too much into the actual experience of meditation and, and mm-hmm. what changed, I think we should sort of start with a, a baseline of when we're talking about boredom, what mm-hmm. is it that we're talking about? What do we mean? So when, when you think about boredom, right. what is that to you? So I, I was doing some thinking on this because I, I think most people have a, an idea of what it is to be bored, and I'm, I think they probably are fairly similar. Um, but I looked up a definition for boredom, and it said, feeling wary because one is unoccupied or lacks interest in one's current activity. So I, I thought about that a bit, and while I think that's all true, I don't know if it captures the, like I, I used the word tormented by boredom earlier, like the, the negativity that a lot, a lot of us feel towards it, like just having nothing to do, I don't think quite summarizes it. So I kind of, I, I took a while to think about it, and I realized that, at least for me, the mind's never actually unoccupied. I mean, that's one of the first things you, you realize when you start meditating. There's, there's always something going on. There's a yep. string of thoughts that just keep going. Um, so I don't think the mind having nothing to do quite maps on to the reality of it. Um, I think it's more that the mind is actively unsatisfied with something. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's sort of one of the things that I wanted to point out as well. And I, I had a similar history with boredom as you. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was an only child, spent a lot of time with Lego and video games and, uh, you know, anxiously awaiting friends arrivals or uh, yeah. all, I had a very, very similar experience. It sounds like, um, and especially after learning to meditate, I realized that, yeah, like you said, it it wasn't that there was nothing to do. It was that Mm. I was sort of unsatisfied with the lack of stimulation that I I was looking for, you know? Um, Yeah. And and I think that comes down to it's, it's a focus that the mind is more comfortable when it has. So when you think about being focused on doing a task, you're usually not bored. Um, right. So I think when you're bored, your mind has an idea of something that would bring it that, um, like the end to its suffering, basically. But it's not able to do that. And knowing that you can't get there or do that at that moment is um, really difficult. So it just, uh, yeah, sorry, it's I didn't mean to like, cut you off. Yeah, it's basically wishing reality to be different than what it is at the moment. So I I do want to dive deep into boredom, but I want to get a little bit more of your story uh, Mm -hmm. as well. Um, So before we move on from the sort of origin up to meditation, I just want to get your take. Do Do you think that that's a fairly common experience that people have? Or do you think that was, you know, uniquely... Do you think you were uniquely bored as a child? <laughs> um, I don't think I was uniquely bored. It's possible that just due to my situation, it was amplified, but I don't think that there was anything inherently different about my boredom than other people's. Like my friends would have similar experiences. I, even, even when we were hanging out, sometimes a friend might say I'm bored or, yeah, you know, be unsatisfied with, the activity we were doing. Um, so I, I think it's probably pretty ubiquitous and uh, I think probably everybody suffers from it at some point. Yeah, I, I, would, I would tend to hypothesize the same, but... Es- especially when it's a word that's such a common, commonly used word. Everybody knows what boredom is. You don't have to yeah. explain it when you mention it to somebody, so... Yeah, yeah. Okay, so when you first got into meditation, you, you mentioned seeing that book on your shelf. Was that sort of the the first your first foray into meditation? 
Uh, I know I wanted to mention, I know that your, your mom meditates. Um, mm -hmm. Was she meditating at the time? Did she have that influence on you? No. Um, actually, she started after I um, pitched it to her, basically, and she saw the changes in how my mind worked. Um, no, but she did give me the book, though, so I guess she <laughs> just hadn't read it. Um, I had always felt some sort of like a connection to nature or a spirituality or something growing up. I, I never had any like concrete ideas. I wasn't religious. Um, but there, I felt like there was something like a, like a deeper level of experience that I could get to sometimes. So I remember I used to go sit out by like the stream in the woods and like it was a very Zen place, you know, and that would always calm me down. And that was kind of a place I went, but I think that was just, I guess it, it gave me a, it gave my mind something to focus on, you know, the sound of the running water, the pretty scenery, the fresh air. Um, but it never had quite the impact that really practicing meditation did. Yeah. Uh, okay. So when you started meditating, uh, can you describe sort of how your relationship with boredom or stimulation changed and how, I guess, what was the progression of those changes? How quick was it? Like, was it mm -hmm. sort of a, a switch turning or was it more gradual? So I, I think for me, it was more along the lines of a switch. Um, you know, that's a, gotta use that word here, but <laughs> he said it switch. <laughs> um, but yeah, it happened fast. And like I said before, I think that's because I was in a place that I was very receptive. I, I think that it may be more of a transition for somebody who's, um, you know, not in the same place I was or is not going quite as, uh, not diving quite as deep so quickly as I was. Because um, I, when I first started, I was meditating, you know, maybe an hour a day, you know, wow. in segments, maybe like. 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes at night, some days maybe more than that. Um, so I really threw myself into it. Um, but I'd, uh, but relating to boredom. Oh, and just to be clear, uh, uh, we are talking about Vipassana meditation as opposed yeah. to some of, some of the other practices. Yeah. Okay. And Vipassana meditation is basically just mindfulness meditation. It's, uh, focusing, um, Return, returning attention. It's basically like can you, working can you out. Just briefly describe. Brain. Can you briefly describe mm -hmm. the, the sort of step by step process? Yeah. It's sure. fairly straightforward. Yeah. So basically, you could do it standing or sitting or walking. Um, you could have it with your eyes closed or open. Um, but basically, you find a place that's both relaxing, but also keeps you aware, not falling asleep. And you find an object of focus. So for me, learning, it was the breath. And that's, I'd say, probably the most common in most forms of meditation because it's something we all have. Um, it's something that is inherent to any uh, animal, basically. And you place your focus on the breath. You find... You find somewhere in the body where you feel the sensation of the breath. So that could be the rising and falling of your belly or somewhere in your nose, which was where what I felt. I'd take a deep breath in and feel where I felt it the most in my nostrils, the, just the sensation of the air going in. And I'd focus on that sensation coming in and then going out. And basically, you just focus on that. You notice how it feels. And when your mind wanders to another thought, you once you realize that it is that it's wandered, you return your attention back to the breath. Right. And it's a never-ending cycle. It's not like it's not going to wander. It will. Yeah. Um, and it's okay if it happens faster or not as fast. But the goal is just to basically to remember to bring your attention back to the breath and to do so once you realize you've left. Yeah. Yeah. And it. It sounds very straightforward and simple, but it is, it's, it's mm -hmm. difficult. Like at first you, you, 
at least in my experience, you feel like you're doing a really good job and then suddenly yeah. you realize that you're not very good at it and it becomes very difficult very quickly. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah. And it, it really is similar to lifting weights or something. Like you're never gonna, there's always the next rep. You're never gonna be, you've never, you'll never win the bench press. Yeah. You know, yeah. you're never done. It's just, <laughs> you're getting better and improving. Yeah. This. And, and so, that, and, I don't, I don't necessarily feel like we need to get into too much detail about how beneficial meditation is, but mm-hmm. uh, you know, it, it suffices to say it is, it has been very positively influential, at least in my life. I imagine in yours as well. Yeah. I'd say the, I know we're talking about it in the context of boredom, but for me, it's just helped me the most with my anxiety because right. that was, a, that was really my issue growing up yep. e- even in third grade, second grade. I think second grade, I missed like 27 days of school or something because I would, I would fake sick, but I was just anxious to go to school and yeah. Um, so, okay. So back to boredom, um, yeah. you, you started describing the changes that, that meditation had for you in terms of how you felt boredom. Uh, can you sort of dive into that? Yeah. So I think it's not so much the way that I felt boredom, but it's just the fact that I didn't go into a state of boredom because I had trained myself to have an object of focus. Yeah. yeah. Um, so where the mind would, when I, if I was bored, the mind might be looking for something to focus on, but I was just so aware that there was so much that I could focus on, whether that's a sound outside, um, the, feeling of my breath or the tingling in my hands or anything, a smell or a a sense or a sight. Mm -hmm. Um, I was just so engrossed in awareness, I guess at that point that I didn't, I just, it didn't arise. Basically my mind was always focused and that's, that's a state that I can't even replicate now. You know, I, it was just a, I was so into that world at that point that that's how I felt. And I, you know, I think it's the beginning of anything. It's the most extreme. Yeah. And I think uh, it died down a little bit, but, and I have a little bit of a different relationship with boredom than I just mentioned, um, which we can get into, but yep, that, that's sort of my next question. So if yeah. you want to, if you want to go ahead and transition into your current relationship with boredom, yeah. feel free. So as far as meditation, I'm, yeah, I think there was maybe like a year after I was, I was really good with meditating for about a year and then I was really bad with it for about a year. And then I was off and on and I'm, I'm fairly regular again with it now, finally. But, um, so I think I've noticed boredom or the, the feeling that I would associate in the past is boredom arise in, you know, day-to-day stuff. And the example I wanted to give was I was in CVS with my girlfriend and she was in the makeup aisle and I was with her and I just felt this extreme boredom. I was like, I I gotta get out of here. I, I want to go do something else. And, and I thought of it as boredom, you know, I'm bored because I'm in the makeup aisle. Right. But when I looked in, I realized it's not really it's that it's that it's just I can't find an object of focus here, and my mind is wandering and reminding me, oh, I have to do this. I have to get home so I can do this. Oh, well, if I went to that aisle, I'd be less bored. I should go look at this. We really got to get home because it's getting late. So my mind was wandering and getting into patterns that were unnecessary, really. Um, and then once I realized that, I was able to take a step back and think, oh, that's what my mind's doing. It's not that I'm bored. I just need to find something for my mind to focus on. So in that instance, I focused on the breath or just started reading one of the labels on some, uh, you know, some makeup or something. And right. yeah. that basically, then I was fine. Yeah. And I think that that was my takeaway from starting to meditate was that was a very similar experience where at first you know, with the excitement of, of, Oh, how can I go apply my meditation skills other places? I didn't feel boredom at all, but now it's very similar to that where 
if I notice myself feeling bored, then I can very easily sort of switch into that, that mindful state. Okay. So transitioning sort of from your story into maybe a bigger picture look at boredom in general, one of the things that I think contradicts uh, a lot of what our culture sees around boredom or even how we thought about boredom as kids, uh, there, there's a link between boredom and creativity or boredom and certain valuable skills. Like there, there's even a saying that I've heard children should be allowed to be bored. And I can't cite where that came from. I'm not sure, but mm-hmm. uh, what do you think about the fact that there's, you know, at least somewhat a, of a positive, um, I'm not sure how to describe it, but there, there's this dichotomy between boredom as suffering and boredom as something that's like this necessary skill to be able to, to deal with. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely important in kids. Uh, I, I think it teaches them to learn how to deal with something that's unpleasant, maybe, and something that will always return. So, like, to a kid, you know that if the next weekend you can't hang out, you know, in our case, like, with somebody, um, it was going to be miserable. So. I, you had to find like create patterns in your mind or create you had to figure out something to do basically right um and if there was nothing to do you had to improvise and look around and think what can i make with what i have basically what can i design that will satisfy what i need but that i don't currently have at the moment right and i think that's the skill that that people yeah. are definitely uh valuing building in, in children when they say things like children should be allowed to be bored. Yeah. Uh, I definitely saw that in myself with especially learning new things uh, or yeah. creative outlets. I, boredom was really a, a catalyst for that. And actually I have a uh, sort of a story, but w- my band in high school, when we were having issues, actually right from the start, we, when we were trying to write songs, none of us had really, been in any sort of ensemble like that before we we didn't really know how to write music together and we came up with this process that ended up working really really well for us and it, it just sort of emerged but what it ended up ended up being is somewhere around two two in the afternoon we'd get the whole band together we'd all go down to the basement where i had the drum set and the organs and the guitar stuff and uh you know we'd all get in there and We'd jam a little bit, maybe cover, try to cover a song, but it, there wasn't a lot of creative outlet. And I, I mm-hmm. think partially it's just because there was so much going on with all of us in all these different places. We were very distracted. Um, also, it was two in the afternoon, and who wants to do music at two in the afternoon? Um, but what I think it allowed us to do was we would stay in there. Once, once we had gotten that first maybe 45 minutes to an hour out of the way of non-creative time, we would stay in there and maybe we'd take a little break for food, but we wouldn't go anywhere. We wouldn't do anything else. And we didn't have other stimulation around us. So what we had was our instruments, some notebooks, we had a whiteboard and basically we starved ourselves of stimulation other than what, whatever we could do to, to be creative musically. And I Mm -hmm. think, I mean, you know, four hours into this process, we were all dying of boredom, which is a phrase I want to talk to, talk to you about in a second. Yeah. We we were basically dying of boredom four hours into this. And then we would sort of, you know, get over the hump of boredom and, you know, somebody would have some little snippet of an idea and they'd play it. And because we were sort of completely starved of this, this other stimulation, our brains were very, very sensitive and receptive to picking up on creative ideas and being able to iterate on them and collaborate. And we would just get this immense creative outlet because, you know, every, it it was almost like a, I want to say like a sensory deprivation tank where like you get in this pod, all your senses are taken away, 
as soon as you get any sensory anything, mm-hmm. you're super sensitive to it. And yeah. you're I, desperate. I, yeah, exactly. Your brain is just yeah. desperate for something. And it became this this really, really good method for us to be super creative and come up with stuff we really liked. Mm-hmm. So I think boredom in that sense, even though it's very painful, it's obviously suffering, it, it was helpful. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I had similar experiences with, you know, even now writing music sometimes, just sticking with it. Eventually something will happen. And, you know, I, I think it's kind of, I was serious when I said, you're desperate because you, you're so you need to change from what you're doing so much that you're more open to new experiences or new ideas, you know, that you might have rejected when you first started, but now you're like, that'll do. Let's do that and build off of it. And as you accumulate these blocks that you accept, I think it just gives you a foundation to work off of. Um, yeah, so I, I definitely had similar experiences even now. Yeah. So, and, oh, go ahead. And with your story, I think that gets to, um, I forget which part of it, but basically it made me think we all like crave change. Mm. So when you're in a room practicing alone for four hours, your, your mind wants change. You know, people want change. They want to, a new this or a new that and they become unsatisfied and want to move on. And I feel like you're just depriving the brain of that, all those new changes. And it just, it has to see the world differently, basically right. to be able to experience that. Yeah. And I think uh, part of our process that made it bearable was the fact that it was collaborative. And mm-hmm. I think if, if any one of us alone had tried to do that exact process, I don't know that it would work, but I still think that, that parts of that can be extrapolated out to other situations. And like you said, with even writing music on your own, definitely you can, you can at least get a similar type of, of process going. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Although honestly, I have to say on my own, um, that process is, fairly unsuccessful yeah when, when i get to a point and i am creatively dead if i try to push through it for hours and hours i usually don't get anywhere so yeah. for me i usually just stop take a break come yeah. back to it later but i think it helped that we had a whiteboard and notebooks mm. so that we could like uh, you know we could just like draw stuff on the whiteboard or you know yeah. write random stuff in notebooks until something else came about but yeah, it, it was supremely helpful in that context mm-hmm. to just force ourselves into being bored. Yeah. So there, there are sort of two topics that I want to hit, and I guess I can let you take either one of them. The first was the language around boredom and the fact that we, we consider it suffering and uh, sort of boredom as a, as a mental state or as an emotion. And the other is social media and stimulation in the modern age and that how that affects things like creativity through keeping us not bored. So it, you can take yeah. either one of those. I'm going to go with the first one. Okay. I'll take a for $200. <laughs> um, so I think the negative language around boredom is just like I was saying earlier, we at least with my experience of it, it's, it is a negative thing. It's, it's suffering. It's wanting uh, your current experience to be different than what it is at the moment. And with Buddhism, you learn, um, Buddhism teaches that the nature of life is suffering. So basically, no matter what state you're in, there's always this inherent unsatisfactoriness that is suffering. You know, it's not that you're always in agony or tormented, but it's never quite enough. And I think boredom is just a a manifestation of that, really. It's being unsatisfied with where you're at currently. And at least in our culture, unsatisfaction is a negative. You know, you want to get the next new thing or uh, find the next thing to do or the next video game or the next friend or whatever it is it could almost it could almost be uh described as that that underlying sense of unsatisfactoriness but brought to the surface because there's nothing to distract you from the fact that it's it's there all the time yeah exactly and i i think that's 
kind of what I was trying to get at earlier with what it's like for children. It's they have to learn to overcome that um, by finding ways to distract themselves, if you want to call it, or um, learn to be creative. But yeah, I agree. It's bringing to the surface that which is usually covered. Yeah, and I think this is starting to get at one of the reasons I think boredom is such an interesting emotion. If you think of it in comparison to other emotions, like, say, anger. Mm -hmm. uh, anger has a very short half-life. It, it, it's fleeting, unless you continually remind yourself that you're angry. Yeah. You know, if you, if you are angry, you can even see this in, in kids. If they're angry or sad or something, and you distract them, then they forget that they're supposed to be angry until they remember what they were angry about. And, or if you get cut off in traffic, this is the classic example is yeah. road rage, right? Yeah. You get cut off in traffic, the incident's over in two seconds. Maybe the car speeds away. There's nothing there, but you're still angry. And if you watch your thoughts during that sort of road rage inclination, you're just repeating it. The, the, the movie of the incident in your head over and over and over or thinking, yeah. you know, oh, I hate driver, I hate other drivers. You know, people are bad at driving, whatever it is. Yeah. You just have to keep repeating it in your head over and over and over. But if you stop doing that, if you notice that that's what you're doing, anger, happiness, sadness, positive and negative emotions, both, I think more so negative emotions have a very, very short, lifespan and, and they diminish very quickly. Mm -hmm. But I think boredom, boredom to me seems a little bit different because mm -hmm. you don't have to remind yourself that you're bored. And I'm sort of hypothesizing out loud here, but yeah. I don't think you have to remind yourself that you're bored to feel boredom. Right. I think it's, it's sort of the opposite of that. Yeah. I agree. If you get out of boredom by remembering that you are bored, Right. And realizing that you should do something about it. Yeah. And you, you can even yeah. do it once you, you sort of think about it in a mindfulness way. Yeah. You can use it as an object of meditation. And suddenly, if you're just observing yourself being bored, you're mm -hmm. likely not bored anymore. And it, right. it, you know, by observing it, it goes away. So I guess yeah. in that way, it, it can be similar. But mm -hmm. I, I do think it's a little bit different with I that. don't think... Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I don't think there's a, a natural state of anger that we all have when right. we're not doing anything. We don't just go back to being furious whenever we lose focus on something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Very interesting. So yeah. uh, the, the social media aspect of things, I, I know you had something that you, you mentioned to me uh, before we recorded that you had something you wanted to say in particular about social media. Mm-hmm. Or, or was it just that you wanted to bring it up? Yeah, so I think social media has become, especially on mobile devices, has become kind of the cure-all for boredom nowadays. And I don't know if it's good or bad. I think as a platform, it's neither. It's just how you use it. But I, do, I am concerned that with there always being something ready to go to take your boredom away, especially for, for kids, like, are you going to have to keep up the skill of making those connections that we were talking about to find something to do, basically practicing your creativity if there's always something preventing you from having to do that? Um, it, it's not that it's bad, it's that it could be preventing you from having to do something you should be doing, basically. So if the phone's taken away, do you still have the skill of basically making connections in the world around you to create something to do, basically? Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I, I think <clears throat> I, I tend to agree, and I think that, that that habit, even in adults, can be fairly detrimental of Anytime you feel any lack of stimulation, you know, mm -hmm. pulling out your phone, um, or I think one of the things that contributes to it, which is a place where I might lean further toward the social media being a negative force side mm -hmm. of things than you, is the fact that they are designed to keep you there. They're designed 
to constantly give you that little trickle of, you know, the dopamine response or whatever it is that keeps mm -hmm. you there. And it's, it's basically a machine to keep you lost in thought to use a more, uh, you know, meditation term. Yeah, I agree. And I think that it may be even worse for other emotions that are not able to be dealt with, like anxiety or mm. anger or sadness or depression. Like, I, I think those could be more troublesome if you just ignore them and find something to cover up, cover them up than boredom, you know? Um, like, I, I see people that I'm close with, you know, in me too, you know, if I'm anxious or something, uh, just go on the phone. That'll bring your attention away. So, right. and maybe that's good for sometimes, you know, maybe that's useful and that's a good tool. But if it's all the time and it lets you not have to seek help or not seek a, a better way to deal with it, right. um, that, that does worry me. It's basically procrastination for problem solving. Yeah, exactly. In an emotional sense. Yeah. Yeah. So has, have you ever talked to anybody else about boredom? Like, have, have you heard some other people's ideas about it or anything like that? Um, not really. I can kind of notice how different people respond to it. Um, but I, I really haven't talked to too many people about it. I, I've seen, you know, being around some kids lately that, they their like attention their need to be doing something is much more heightened than most adults so i, I can see why like it you can see them be bored mm. like actively if they're not doing something and just how like how much it pains them to to be in that state you know yeah I think, I think as we get older, it naturally diminishes a little bit. I think experiences kind of flatten out once you're an adult. You know, the highs aren't quite as high and the lows aren't quite as low. But, um, <laughs> oh, okay, I apparently I activated Siri. Um, <laughs> Oops. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I think that's that's fairly true. Um, yeah. Were there any other aspects of boredom that you wanted to talk about that I, I might have missed? Um, I don't think so. Really, the only only thing I would take away from it that I think is important is just think about boredom, basically. you know, right. it, Maybe I have it all wrong for everybody else. You know, It could be more simple, but um, it's worth taking a look at, like any emotion, really. Yeah. Yep. I, I would, I would agree with that. I think just like any other emotion to classify boredom as necessarily good or bad is right. probably a mistake. And it, it really has to do with how you treat boredom and how you are, how you handle it. Yeah. Uh, Cause it, it is, it's natural to feel bored. Yep. I agree. So it, with that, I want to transition to a segment we like to call no a segment that we I, I just don't like introducing it that way um, yeah a segment that that we want to call the off topic where you can basically talk about anything you you'd like and I, I briefed you a little bit on this before but mm -hmm. um, it could be just to reiterate it could be any topic you want from uh, you want to pitch some charity that you think is really cool and important to yep. some philosophical idea that's affected you to a book you like or something somebody said to you in the grocery store. Like, you know, it could be any of those things. Yeah. So uh, what do you have for the off topic? So I've been thinking lately about uh, kind of going back to a podcast that I know we both listened to a long time ago with William McCaskill. Mm -hmm. um, and he has the effective altruism uh, thing going, but it's basically like how to do the most good with what you have. I, I feel like that's a, very basic summary, but so I was thinking about this with myself and I wanted to just kind of bounce it off you. Sure. And the idea is, is there a moral issue with pursuing your passion? Basically, is it wrong to do so? Um, or maybe not wrong, but morally inferior 
to something else. So, so he mentioned that I, I think it was something like two thousand dollars can either save a life or make a significant impact on a life in a developing country. Yeah. Um. So basically, if we have the skill and opportunity, is the best moral situation to basically find the highest paying job we can do master it make the most money we possibly can and then donate or invest as much of it as we can into saving those people basically like if that is one option how is being a musician like uh morally equivalent to that i guess right right and i don't think anybody would say it is but if we have the ability to do that, like with um, resources or where we're born, who our parents are, you know, what our talents are, is it basically, is it wrong to do something just because you love it? And, and I'm not suggesting that you go do something you hate. Right. But like, if you'd say I'd, I'd be fine being a hedge fund manager, you know, and making billions of dollars or, you know, making lots of money. Is that, and, and devoting everything you have to it, you know, right. and then putting millions and millions of dollars into helping people. Um, basically, do you think that's a fair? Do you think that's a fair thing to put up against, like pursuing your passion? Um, yeah, I, I, that's really interesting. I have heard that before, um, and I think the problem is there's more I'm sort of thinking about this out loud and I, I'm yeah. totally willing to admit wrong if this doesn't make sense. But <laughs> my initial reaction is that there is life is more complex in a sense than sort of being able to very simply measure what you're doing and it's return monetarily translating into, you know, charitable good. Mm hmm. Because I think there are certain things like, okay, the hedge fund manager example versus music. Obviously, most music careers are, they pay much, much less than a career as a hedge fund manager or, or some other high paying mm -hmm. career uh, in some other field. But I think. I think there's inherent value culturally and societally that we're not necessarily taking into account if we're just talking about capital uh, mm -hmm. being generated and how much of that you can give to other parts in society. And, and again, I, I may be wrong about this, but the first example I can think of is like maybe there's some you know group of powerhouse investors that are making incredible charitable donations. And whatever they do during the day, they're, you know, sitting there in their offices, typing away or scribbling away on their pads or whatever. And what gets them through that is, you know, having a playlist of indie bands to listen to <laughs> or, yeah. you know, something like that where it, it obviously it's not a direct payoff and I'm sure that there's some other alternative, like if the indie bands disappeared because they all became you know, charitable <laughs> workers or something like that. I'm sure that, that the, the investor, the powerhouse investor people would have some other alternative for getting them through the day. Mm -hmm. But I think that there's such a big cultural value to something like music that mm -hmm. that may not be the right kind of trade off to make. But right. I think that there is some merit to the other side of the idea as well, especially if the passion that you're pursuing is something that, I don't know. It's definitely a hard question, but yeah. Um, and I, and I don't really expect you to have an answer to it. I just, yeah. I wanted to raise it because it's something I haven't really been able to sort out. Cause I can't really see like, there's so many people that want to be musicians, you know, or be right. artists that there's going to be somebody to fill that spot. And while they may not make the same music you would have, and you know, every musician will bring a unique, um, you know, 
bring a unique um, cultural piece of work to society, which I do think is valuable. And I don't want to put no value on that. I'm just thinking relative to that of the example I provided. And from a sort of cold calculating perspective, if, right. if what you, if what you're measuring is total happiness for all people mm -hmm. and you're just adding it up and I don't know. Yeah. The, yeah. Just basically net happiness over entire population of, of humans or, or even conscious creatures. I think yeah. that may miss something that's more detailed or more, I don't know. Cause I, yeah. I just, I think there's something to be said for the, for the fact that I, I think, I think it, it would be, a, it's a better world and in some sense more achievable, but that, I guess that shouldn't really factor in. It is mm -hmm. a better world where you can have a distribution of happiness than a, if you imagine like a, almost like a bell curve, right? Right. Where you've got people on either end that are either very unhappy or very happy, but most people sort of sit somewhere in the middle, you know, maybe a little below, maybe a little above average. Mm -hmm. Having some distribution of happiness to me seems like a more meaningful world than a happy, than a world where, you know, you've got sort of the average, everybody's at the average of right. happiness because then you don't have extremely positive experiences that, that help people contribute to society as a whole. I think, I think the issue with that static calculation and valuing things in that way is that it could potentially lead to a static society. Mm -hmm. And maybe this is a stretch, but I think in order to have societal progress and to, to bootstrap ourselves into a, a world with more happy people in more ways, I think we necessarily have to have a distribution of, of happiness and wealth and all the other things that we're sort of putting into the equation as mm -hmm. if they are equal factors across the board. Yeah. And, and I would agree with that, but I, I guess I'm thinking about it more from a individual standpoint, right? Like, yeah. so basically our whole society is based on uh, people pursuing their own interest. Right. Right. So I'm almost picturing like if you realize like almost like you get out of the matrix, you get out of the system, right. And you realize that that's how the system works. And you realize that you don't need that specific to follow that system, to be happy, to be content. So basically you realize, okay, there's not a ton of people that are in the same state of mind as me. So I should be one of the people that pursue this mm. because I'm uh, of the very few, I, and I'm not saying I'm some like enlightened out of the culture person. <laughs> I'm just proposing this person exists. Yeah. Um, but if, if that person, I guess I'm saying that person may be in a more unique position to be able to do something like that mm -hmm. than the, every person who wants to be a musician, uh, would be to become a musician almost, you know? Mm. Um, yeah, it's an interesting topic. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah. And it's definitely worth thinking about. And, you know, maybe in the future we can have some episode where we basically just discuss, you know, what that looks like and how yeah. to, how to best make that decision or make that those kinds of decisions. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that about wraps things up. Alex, thank you for being our first guest. And I'm looking forward to uh, metaphorically having you on this side of the table while we <laughs> have other guests and uh, looking forward to having you as my co-host. So yeah, so am I. I think the switch has an interesting future ahead and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. Thanks, Chase. Thanks, Alex. <laughs>